while we wait, I know quite a lot of limericks. <laughs> <clears throat> We're only doing this because of the insane demands of security, which neither Dinesh nor I asked for. We didn't want to be protected from you people. <laughs> but if, if it must needs be that your bags are searched and your persons humiliated, it must needs be. He's ready. I'm ready. He's ready. Good evening, everyone. My name is Father Kevin Augustine. I'm the pastor of the St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Center and the director of the Aquinas Institute for Catholic Thought. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to our second annual debate in honor of our patron, St. Thomas Aquinas, whose feast day is celebrated on January 28th. St. Thomas was a medieval philosopher, theologian, Dominican priest, and the greatest thinker of his day, and one of the greatest of all time. Because of his love of truth, St. Thomas never shied away from a good debate or a heated controversy, and he is best known for his brilliant synthesis of faith and reason. One of the main methods of education during his day, of arriving at the truth of things, were several day-long several day disputations on a wide variety of topics. It is in this spirit that we welcome you here tonight. First, many thanks uh, to uh, several different groups and people. Uh, first to our Sunday Visitor Institute, the Augustan Institute, and Jim Pfaff from Opinion Times for co-sponsoring this event, to Mackey Auditorium for allowing us to use this facility, to all the students of the St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Center who helped pull this event together, for Matthew Botker, uh, the chief architect of this event, and a thank you, a special thank you, uh, to our two speakers tonight, to Mr. Christopher Hitchens and Mr. Dinesh D'Souza, as well as to Dan Kaplis, who has agreed to moderate. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here with us. As I'm sure many of you know, survey cards were handed out as you came in tonight. Uh, this is a little survey uh, for us to see uh, who has come with what views and to what extent people may have been persuaded one way or another. So of course you don't want to fill out those cards until after the debate is over. <laughs> uh, to uh, encourage you to fill out those cards and to turn them in, we will be raffling off an iPod Touch after the debate. <laughs> Not sure what that is. Okay. <laughs> but I'm sure it's great. <laughs> now, to be entered in this debate, which will take place you know, off stage tomorrow, and we'll contact the winner tomorrow. To be entered, you must fill out the survey completely, and we will contact you tomorrow if you've won. Please hand the completed surveys to ushers on your way out, or drop them in the boxes just outside the auditorium. The main sponsor for tonight is, tonight's event is the Aquinas Institute for Catholic Thought, which is the intellectual outreach arm of the St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Center, which is the Catholic campus ministry which serves the University of Colorado. It exists, the Aquinas Institute, to educate students, faculty, staff, and the broader Boulder community in the Catholic intellectual tradition. We seek to establish a continuous scholarly relationship with the University of Colorado Boulder without compromise or dilution to the gospel of Jesus Christ as expressed in the magisterium of the Catholic Church for the common good of all. As you know from tonight's event, one of the many ways that we apply this mission is through an on-campus lecture series. We bring excellent scholars from around the country, as we have tonight, to speak on a wide range of topics pertinent to our day and age. Recently, I have done uh, several interviews in anticipation of this event. One of the most often questions is asked from genuine surprise, although to me I have to admit it's a little strange. It goes something like this. Why are you doing this? Aren't Catholics supposed to be closed-minded? 
Afraid of questions and disputes, is this some new modern approach? My response has been no, this is not particularly a modern approach. In fact, it's actually quite medieval. As Catholics, we are not afraid of a good debate, intellectual dialogue, and posing difficult questions, especially the most basic, which also tend to be the most profound. Who are we? Where do we come from? What is our purpose? What does it mean to be human? How does one achieve the good or happy life in the classical sense of Aristotle? Now, we believe, of course, that reason is on our side, but why not fight it out a bit? Finally, we believe that faith and reason are not opposed to each other. Rather, they illuminate one another, and together they help the human person to arrive at truth. It is with these principles in mind that we host tonight's event. Just a reminder that this is a, an intellectual debate rather than an emotional one. Feel free to applaud our speakers, but please refrain from any outbursts or booing. If you are interested in finding out more about the St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Center, the Aquinas Institute, or upcoming events, there is more information available in the entryways. Having said all that, it, bring, it brings me great pleasure to introduce to you tonight's moderator, Mr. Dan Kaplis. Mr. Kaplis graduated with honors from the University of Colorado at Boulder, where he also served as student body president and was named the National Evans Scholar of the Year. Dan was then awarded a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Colorado School of Law. While at CU, Dan served on the Parish Council of St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Center. He is a respected legal analyst, and he has been a regular guest on national interview shows such as Larry King Live and The O'Reilly Factor. Dan is the host of the award-winning Kaplis and Silverman show on 630 KHOW. Mr. Kaplis's work on behalf of the disadvantaged has been recognized by numerous organizations, and recent honors include the Pro Vitae Award from the Archdiocese of Denver. In connection with his media work, 5280 Magazine named Dan among the 25 most powerful in Denver. Mr. Kaplis is married to Amy Sporer Kaplis. They are the proud parents of two wonderful children, 11-year-old Joe and 8-year-old Caroline. Please welcome Mr. Dan Kaplis. Thank you, Father. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Let's hear it for Father. Not only is he not afraid of opposing points of view, but... But he brings in one of the most brilliant, effective, sought-after speakers in the world on that point of view in Christopher Hitchens. And so we're all grateful for that. Hey, and, and a quick, quick note about the Thomas Center. You know, whether, whatever faith background you're from or none at all, trust me, you are welcome there as a guy who stumbled in there in the turbulent 70s, which make what you're going through look like romper room. It's just a, a loving, welcoming place, and, uh, and I'd encourage everybody, whatever age, to, uh, to drop by the Thomas Center at some point. Uh, as Father said, we're not in church tonight. We know that because there are people sitting in the front row. And so <laughs> that, means that, uh, that means that you're free to express yourself, but all positive, all positive, obviously, tonight. And uh, a confession I have to make, uh, I love prize fights. I love traveling to go to prize fights, but I've looked forward to tonight with these two guys more than any fight I can remember because there's something about that battle of great intellects. You know, one of the most profound issues in life that, that's just so much more stimulating than seeing guys, you know, knock each other's heads off. But make no mistake about it, I mean, spending 10 minutes backstage with these guys, they truly want a piece of each other. I mean, they, you know, <laughs> highly unlikely anybody is going to leave with, uh, with a broken nose, but, uh, but these are two brilliant men, and, and they are deeply committed to their positions, and they are in it to win it. They are here tonight to win. And, and the format sets up beautifully for that, unlike those presidential debates, which we all know were anything other than debates. Uh, tonight will be. Tonight will be. And uh, we're going to go this way. Um, Dinesh will get 15 minutes to open, and then Christopher will have a 15-minute opening. Guy down there taking notes, that's good. 
you get all this right, you get a free pass into CU Law School. Uh, Dinesh then gets a five-minute rebuttal, Christopher a five-minute rebuttal, but then they go mano a mano. They get 15 minutes head-to-head, -head, directly questioning each other, and, uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And then rather than, they've each given up some time at the end with their closing statements to give more time to you, and everybody's grateful you came out on such a, a cold night and packed Mackey Auditorium, so we'll have a full 40 minutes at the end for audience questions. The operative word being questions, not speeches, not statements, etc. I have the privilege of hosting a talk show, so if we have to cut people off, we will. Not to be mean, but the whole idea is to take advantage of our time with these two gentlemen. And then Father Kevin will have the taser if anything goes, goes on too long. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to be the don't tase me bro guy, trust me. Um, Christopher Hitchens, what an opportunity tonight, whether, whether you come in uh, with a point of view similar to Christopher's or like some of us with an opposing point of view, it does not matter. This man is fascinating. He uh, is the author of 10 books, the most recent one, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. It, uh, <laughs> Forbes magazine, one of the most influential liberals in the United States, according to Forbes, uh, of course, a prominent editor with Vanity Fair, and again, truly one of the most sought after speakers in the world on this topic and others as well. And, uh, you know, d equals here, Dinesh D'Souza, Dinesh, a native of uh, Mumbai, India, and uh, the author of What's So Great About America and What's So Great About Christianity, two separate books, both bestsellers. New York Times calls Dinesh one of the most influential conservative thinkers in America. Uh, again, he, one of the most admired and sought after defenders of the faith, and also a foreign policy analyst in the Reagan administration. Let's hear it for both of our outstanding <laughs> guests tonight. Nice to get you. <laughs> Thank you all um, very much. I am um, honored and delighted to be here. It, this is a, um, a great venue, a beautiful venue. I, well, my podium's a little narrow, but I guess that's okay since I remember to wear pants. <laughs> uh, and uh, this, is not, this is not my first debate uh, with Christopher Hitchens. We've actually debated a few times before I'm not sure why we keep doing it. One of us may be a slow learner. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I will say that all of our debates have, have been totally different. And so I always approach these with a tremendous sense of suspense and um, anticipation. Well, we're here to talk about um, what's so great about God. Um, and I want to emphasize that in this debate, uh, which is in not just a secular venue, but the secular venue of Boulder, which may be for me the lion's den, <laughs> but our approach in these debates, and certainly mine, is to make arguments that in no way depend on the authority of scripture, or revelation, or in no way presume the truth of Christianity. Uh, these are arguments that are going to be rooted in reason and skepticism and history and philosophy. In other words, Christopher Webb, uh, Hitchens and I are, are debating with the same weapons. We're debating on the same ground, which is the ground of reason alone. And so in thinking about what's so great about God, I thought I would frame my remarks by beginning to ask, what are the things that are important to not religious people, not Christians, but secular people, and in fact, atheists? I've been skimming some of the books of some of the new atheists to make a list of some of the values that the new atheists, like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, the philosopher Daniel Dennett, uh, the bioethicist Peter Singer, what do they care about? Well, uh, they care about the idea of the individual. They care about science as 
an independent and autonomous enterprise. Uh, they care about the equal dignity of women. Uh, they care about the abolition of slavery. Uh, they celebrate compassion as a social virtue. I want to argue that it is not merely the idea of God, but very specifically the active work of Christianity that brought these very values, secular values, into the orbit of Western civilization, and in some cases, into the world. Now, I'm hardly being controversial in asserting that Western civilization, our civilization, is built on two pillars, Athens and Jerusalem. By Athens, of course, we mean classical reason. And by Jerusalem, I think we mean the combined legacy of Judaism and Christianity. And if you look at a list of what we can for a moment call the atheist virtues, we can ask, is it true that those virtues are ours, shared by believer and non-believer alike, because of this legacy of Athens and Jerusalem? Consider for a moment the, the virtue of compassion. One can go to ancient Greece and Rome before Christianity and look for that virtue. Aristotle makes a list of the virtues. Uh, compassion, by the way, does not appear on the list. Uh, for Aristotle, it's something more like a vice. Uh, compassion comes into the West as a new virtue with Christianity. Or consider something else, the, the value or preciousness of human life, an important value in our culture who would deny? Well, in ancient Sparta, if you were weak or sick, uh, they would uh, deposit you on the hillside in the winter and were quite happy to find you dead in the morning. And that's not even the big scandal. The great thinkers of ancient uh, Greece, uh, Plato, Aristotle, knew about this, but viewed it with relative equanimity. It was to them not such a big deal. And why? Because the sanctity of human life, the preciousness or sacredness of life, was simply not a cardinal value in classical antiquity, in Greco-Roman civilization that became important to us with Christianity. Sam Harris, in his book, The uh, End of uh, Faith, says that the Christians bear a big responsibility for slavery. And yet slavery has existed for millennia in every known civilization. For many centuries, slavery needed no defenders because it had no critics. It was like the family taken pretty much for granted. Only in one civilization, the civilization called Christendom, did slavery become controversial. And some people say, well, we had to wait till the Enlightenment and the modern period for that to happen. Not true. Slavery was, in fact, withered and abolished in Western civilization and in Europe largely between the 4th century and the 10th century. Then there was a second anti-slavery movement in the modern era in which a groups of Quakers and evangelical Christians began to take the idea, a theological idea, that were created equal in the eyes of God and to draw from that a political lesson. Namely, no man has the right to rule another man without consent. And by the way, this idea becomes not only the moral root of abolition or anti-slavery, it's also, if you think about it, it's also the moral root of democracy. Why? Because democracy is based on the idea that no man, no person has the right to rule another without consent. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that whatever you think of God, even if you're not a believer, it seems to me to be the the beginning of intellectual and historical honesty to acknowledge that all of us, Christian and non-Christian alike, are in fact standing on a pillar that we ought to respect and acknowledge. In some senses, even the values that Christopher Hitchens stands by would not be here, and he wouldn't hold them if it wasn't for the role of Christianity in the world. I want to suggest that even modern science is rooted in not just theist, but specifically Christian assumptions. This seems a little bit strange to some people because they say, oh, science is based on reason, but 
religion is based on faith. Actually, that's not so. Science, too, is based on three faith-based propositions that can in no way be derived from reason, and in fact, are the direct legacy of Christian theology. What are those three faith-based propositions? Number one, we live in a rational universe. That's not exactly obvious. You or I can be rational because we have a brain. The universe, as far as we know, does not possess a brain. And yet, it is presumed to be rational. The universe is also presumed by modern science to be lawful, to, to have operations that can be described in the lawful language of mathematics. And finally, not only is the universe presumed to be rational and lawful, but the rationality of the world out there is presumed by modern science to be mirrored in the rationality of our own minds. If you think about it, that's the strangest fact of all. Your brain is made up of atoms and molecules and neurons and circuits. Why should all the worrying that's going on in here have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the rotation of the planets or E equals MC square or any of the stuff going on out there? Why should there be a match between the two? What is the reason? There is, in fact, no reason. Now, if you're a Christian, all of this makes a certain kind of sense to you. You can say, I believe God is omniscient, which is another word for super rational. So, hey, he made a rational world. I believe God's a lawgiver. He gave us the moral law, the Ten Commandments, let's say. So it's not too surprising he gave us the physical law, the laws of nature. And we believe we're created in the image of God, which is to say we have in us a spark of that divine rationality. And therefore, it's not entirely mysterious that we're capable of comprehending, of apprehending the world out there. But my point is, if you're an atheist, you've got to take these things 100% on faith. Notice that it's no accident that modern science, the scientific method, laboratories, verification, checking, did not develop simultaneously in all cultures. It developed in Western culture. And this, I believe, is the explanation for it. Now, what's so great about God? I think one thing that's great about God is that he has given us a universe adapted or finely tuned for life. Here's what I mean by this. I don't mean that we live on a lucky planet that happens to be the right distance away from the sun. I rather mean that if you look at the fundamental numerical values of nature, if you look at the hydrogen atom, the mass of the proton is 1,836 times the mass of the electron. If you look at the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, if you look at all the different constants of nature, one physicist, Lee Smolin, says, it's almost as if God is sitting at a table with a bunch of dials in front of him. What happens, modern science asks, if the scientists sneak into the room, each dial now reflects a certain numerical value of nature? What if you fool with the dials? Change them a little bit. This issue, by the way, is discussed by Stephen Hawking in his book, A Brief History of Time. And Hawking points out that if you touch one of the dials, he's talking about the rate of expansion of the universe, and you move it, not 10% uh, or 1%, but one part in a hundred thousandth millionth million, you would have no universe, you would have no life. What does this mean? What it means is not just our planet, but the entire universe has to be as big as it is and as old as it is and have precisely the numerical values that it does because if it didn't, we wouldn't be here. The universe appears to be a kind of giant conspiracy to produce, well, us. And I think we owe a little bit of a thank you note to God for that one. <laughs> or perhaps Christopher Hitchens will come up with a better explanation. Now, I think we also need to be grateful to God, if you will, 
because of something that we have uniquely that makes us human. Something that in some strange sense almost appears to defy natural explanation. And by natural explanation, what I mean, of course, is not, on, not just the explanations of evolution or, or Darwin, but in a deeper sense, the explanation of being captive to physical laws. While all objects in the universe operate according to fixed laws, a stone, for example, has no choice but to roll down a hill, a cheetah has very little choice but to run after an antelope, we as human beings inhabit two rather distinct domains. On the one hand, this is the way we are. But then there's a second domain. This is the way we ought to be. In other words, we have this doubleness to our nature. And what's particular about the second domain, the domain of the ought, is that it appears to be free. In other words, you could never say to someone, you ought to do this, or you shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't discriminate on the basis of race, or you shouldn't be a gay basher, if they had no choice in the matter. If their decision was solely determined by physical laws, all of morality would be an illusion. But morality is as real of a fact in the world as any other. It's as real as this watch in front of me. If, there's a, if there are human beings who are without morality, we don't have philosophical disputations with them. We put them in straitjackets and carry them away. They're sociopaths. So the point I'm trying to make here is that not only is morality, if you will, a strange fact in the world, but it's a fact that militates against self-interest. And that is part of its peculiarity. Now, if you're an atheist, you might say, I'm grateful to Christianity, I'm grateful to the legacy of Christianity. No. What should I do about all this? And I think what you should do about all this is, is, number one, to respect the fact that our world is the way it is, and your values are the way you are because of God, and specifically because of Christianity. And second, you might do well to consider living as if there is a God, because ultimately that will make you a better person. And if you give thanks to God, and if you talk to God, you never know. He might say something back. Thank you very much. Shall I just do it? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Dinesh. Um, am I audible to all? Make it more convincing. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dinesh. Dinesh is quite right to say, to have said to you, that there's no element of prearrangement in any of our debates. We've never concerted or compared notes uh, before starting. And I hope we never will. We've never given the same speeches twice. We've sometimes repeated each other and each other's arguments. Um, but there must be an energy leak somewhere uh, this evening because um, he wanted to praise me and my fellow atheists for our compassion. There must be some mistake here, at least in my case. <laughs> uh, one of the very few times I've ever f felt like being a Christian is when reading how the early church fathers lost for an account of why it is fun to be in paradise. The, the alleviation of the first hundred million years of saying thank you, for example, uh, would say, well, at least you can go to the lip of the thing and look down and see the screams and wails and torments of the damned when you want to be cheered up. And I think, that's me. <laughs> I'd be religious on that basis. Um, one of my very few pleasures, actually, is um, uh, crowing over the misfortunes of other people and trying to add to those misfortunes. <laughs> and I'm hoping, in fact, to score a few points of that sort uh, tonight. Um, <laughs> Thomas Aquinas, like me, didn't believe in astrology, or rather he didn't think you should try it because it would only let the demons in. He thought it was a very dangerous science, the sort of thing that could allow the devils a foothold. Unlike me, believed himself capable of levitation, had a higher opinion of himself, in fact, as a debater than I do of myself. But Dinesh has left me with a no, no alternative but to start at a position I hadn't ever begun with before. 
which is to ask anyone here if they've read a novel called When It Was Dark by Guy Thorne. There's an off chance. I thought someone read that. It was a huge bestseller before the First World War. Enormous international bestseller. I'll very quickly summarize its plot for you. From Palestine there comes a report that the bones, that the grave in other words, the cadaver, the remains of a Nazarene martyr, evidently someone who'd been subjected to crucifixion, have been discovered um, in a tomb where a stone had to be rolled away to unearth it. And more and more the rumor is uh, believed and reported in international press that the mortal remains of Jesus of Nazareth have been found. What are the consequences? Well, the consequences are just what you would expect. Uh, people start having sex in the streets. Uh, they don't care for family values anymore. They dissolve the ties of kinship that bond them with uh, their own relatives, indeed with other human beings. Uh, they steal, they rob, they cheat, they lie. All restraint is gone. And it's only by the miraculous uh, discovery that all this initial story is a fraud put around by Jews and secularists and Freemasons and other riffraff that morality is restored to the human race. <laughs> I recommend a reading of this piece of trash novel, um, which makes the Da Vinci Code or the Left Behind series seem like Proust or Balzac or George Eliot. <laughs> because unless you believe something like that, everything Dinesh says, just said to you is complete nonsense from beginning to end. I invite you to the thought experiment. If it could be shown to you that the figure of the Nazarene was, in fact, as we believe, entirely mythical, as was the figure of his mother, as was the figure of Vishnu, as was the revelation supposedly given to the illiterate Arabian uh, merchant, uh, peasant, uh, Muhammad, the man calling himself the prophet, um, as was the existence of Moses and the the legend of the Exodus. If all of this can be shown as it can be, I haven't time for it, but I'll, I'll take any challenge on any of these points, to be an entirely man-made legend, would you really look at your neighbor differently? Are you telling me, or are you willing to be told, even by someone as fluent and charming as Dinesh, that it, it would be true of yourself, that you would then become a thief, that you would then become a liar, that you would then not condemn a rapist, that you would then have no knowledge of the difference between a right action and a wicked one. I don't think there's anyone in this room who could be so abject, so wanting in self-respect, so masochistic, so subject, and I'm coming back to this, so servile as to believe any such thing. And if I had to stop now, uh, that's all I would really have wanted to say this evening. But as I say, I didn't come to be compassionate. I have some more suffering to inflict on you before I'm done. <laughs> Morally, ethically, I submit we would be in precisely the same case as we are now if, as is in fact the case, these stories are proved to be man-made legends. We would be faced with the same questions that we are ever faced with. What are our duties to one another? Why are we here? Does our existence have a meaning or a purpose or a pattern beyond what we can discern? Uh, how can we build the just uh, city? Uh, do, does our presence here have a point? Um, these questions predate monotheism, were debated very earnestly in schools of philosophy in the Mediterranean long before monotheism was inflicted upon us. And these questions would remain as urgent and they would have to be posed again and anew in every generation if monotheism were by chance to decline, as it has been doing, or even to pass away, which I don't think that it actually will. But the same would be true if polytheism was to undergo a similar uh, collapse. Uh, now the believers say, that the problems I've just mentioned don't really exist. They're only problems in the mind of philosophers. The question of how to be moral and why has already been decided. Uh, Dinesh, I think rather too uh, tolerantly, uh, said that he had an open mind on matters of faith, wasn't here to defend the Christian religion or revelation or any of these things. I don't know what kind of, I leave it to the good father, uh, what kind of Catholic Dinesh now seems to be in his own eyes or anyone else's, but in fact, Religion means you must believe that God has revealed himself to us and his purpose, that his commandments and wishes are knowable and indeed known by human beings, that this revelation has in fact taken place. 
and that all that is required is for us to live up to, created sick as we are, commanded to be well as we also are. What kind of dictatorship creates you ill and then orders you to recover? I'll come back to that. But, but created sick as we are, our duty is simply to live up to these preachments, this revelation. That is what religion means to me. If anyone wants to stand up and say it's not what it means, I'll take the question. I can't wait for it, in fact. And that what's, what we're short only of prayer and faith and good works, and that we can have our sins expiated for us, that there can be vicarious atonement, that our, our shortcomings can be taken upon someone else whose pain and misery and suffering can, can redeem us. In other words, that I come to you, madam or sir, and say, not that I will pay your debt because I know you're in trouble and I have some spare money. Not that I will take your place in prison, which I might, if I really loved you, be willing to do. Not if I, that I would take a risk for you, put my own body in front of yours to prevent suffering from falling upon you or coming upon you as I would with a child of mine. But know that I can take away your sins, that I can make them go away, that vicarious redemption and expiation is possible. In other words, that personal responsibility means nothing, that you can throw your sins onto a scapegoat. And rightly is scapegoating considered by us to be a contemptible term, a contemptible verb. No, it won't do. It won't do morally. It won't do ethically. And there is no reason to suppose that any such moment of vicarious expiation or redemption ever took place. Now, when I said in my subtitle, this is a lousy microphone, isn't it? Um, or is it only for me? Um, <laughs> When I, when I said in my subtitle that there's something about religion that poisons everything, I know publishers like controversial subtitles, but I was willing to stand by it. And I knew people would say everything. I mean, cricket, uh, tantric sex, Chinese food. Yes, I sort of do mean, in a way, everything. For this reason, it attacks us in our deepest integrity, in some of the ways I've just tried to describe. It says we, we don't ourselves have any innate knowledge of what's good or wicked. We couldn't, on our own responsibility, out of our own self-respect, decide upon an action in this way and decide to defend its integrity. We would need divine permission and maybe, maybe even a human sacrifice or two to ram it home for this to occur. And I go on to say that it makes intelligent people say stupid things and it makes decent and kindly people do and say very cruel things. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, what would you say, Dinesh, would, was the lifetime now established scientifically of Homo sapiens? Uh, Francis Collins, the Christian uh, chairman of the D Human Genome Project, thinks it could be 150,000 years. Um, Richard Dawkins thinks it could be as much as a quarter of a million. I'll, I don't know, does anyone have a... I'm, I'm excluding those who think it's only 6,000. It, what if I call it 100,000? Right. All right, then. For 100,000 years, 100,000 years, Homo sapiens been on the planet. A, a fragment of evolutionary time. During that time, people were born, uh, usually dying in the process, or at least a, a 10 to 20% chance of doing so. If they survive infancy, the odds go up there a lot. They probably have a life expectancy for the first 50, 60, 70,000 years of about 25 to 30 years usually dying of their teeth. Um, the rending pains of childbirth killing the mothers as well. Uh, famine, disease, fear, terror. Earthquakes, where do they come from? Thunderstorms, why? Hurricanes, what is this? Volcanic explosions that blot out the sun. A a appalling life of fear and want um, and disease where germs are not known of. Uh, you know, don't have to draw your complete picture. And that's to leave out the wars over territory over sex, over womanhood, over possession, that, that would additionally take life. And this is the Hobbesian situation. Life is, as Thomas Hobbes describes in Leviathan, very nasty, brutish, and short. And I'm just asking for 100 years, 100,000 years of this. For the first 98,000 years of it, heaven watches with indifference. Who cares? It doesn't look terrific. But, you know, they're inching along, I guess. I mean, some, sometimes moving forward, sometimes a bit back, but no, you know, 
but anyway, let's just see how it goes. 2,000 years ago, it's decided, actually, now we have to intervene. But only in illiterate parts of the Middle East to reveal our face to this species and tell them how to behave. That should do it. Now, I can't prove that that did not happen. I cannot disprove that. But I can say of someone who does believe it that they're willing to believe pretty much anything. And I don't, believe, I don't just mean believe pretty much anything that they're told. I mean to believe almost anything about their deity. Because if that is how it happened, it's the same as saying that, the, that a universe that contains perhaps 100,000 million planets contains just one, which has one favored mammalian species alone chosen for salvation while the others go into black holes, white dwarves, shooting stars, imploding comets, and the rest of it. You could believe that if you want. I can't tell you that wasn't the design. But I can tell you, or I can assert, I can make you think, I can ask you to consider whether the person responsible for this is not either very incompetent, very tinkering, uh, very capricious, uh, or very, very cruel. And I won't let you hope, I, I hope I won't let you go home without uh, leaving these questions in your mind. I, I'm not going to answer them for you. I'm, I'm going to hope I've placed them where you'll have to think about answering them for yourselves. And I see my time is very nearly exhausted. Um, in other words, I think that our, our uh, morality is innate, our ethics are innate to us, as they are in other mammalian and primate species. It's, it's observable that there are solidarities, there are ways of uh, group behavior, uh, family function, and so forth, that make it clear that without this kind of evolution, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We wouldn't be here if we only looked out for each other, and other, other primates and mammals know this too. In that case, since the evils are innate in us as well, what are we to do? Are we to invent another supernatural person who's responsible for those, as the religious tend to do? Are those don't come from this god, they come from another god, an evil one. Well, fine, if you wish, if you want to do it, if it makes you feel better in some way, um, invent another supernatural entity. There's an infinite multiplication of them that you can do, as Aquinas did with the demons, as Muhammad did with the, with the, with the desert jinns. Keep multiplying these assumptions. But how long can a healthy mind be satisfied with the infinite replication of supernatural assumptions when the natural world explains itself and when we already have enough explanation for why people are encoded and programmed the way they are, where our knowledge of that is increasing all the time. What is, and I'll close on this and I'll be quick, what we risk if we take the supernatural route is the idea of an unchangeable, unalterable authority, one apparently benign, one apparently wicked, both of them eternal, both of them unchanging and unchangeable, and ourselves as their playthings and their, their objects, and their uh, raw material. This is the origin of the idea of the totalitarian. This is where the idea of, of, of tyranny begins, with the, with the eternal, unchanging, tyrannical authority, uh, where we must try, with our poor powers, to guess what's wanted of us, and to spend our lives on our knees. I say, the beginning of emancipation is to repudiate this antique serfdom and all the, all the contemptible and often laughable superstitions that it requires for its maintenance. And the job can be begun tonight, and I invite you to join me in doing so. Thank you. When I first uh, came to America from India, I, uh, as an exchange student, I was assigned to live in Arizona. And one of my first uh, entertainments was to go to a rodeo. I feel like I'm uh, back at the rodeo, by which I mean in listening to Christopher Hitchens, I see um, a point here, a point there, but also a lot of bull in between. Oh, <laughs> Come on, baby, I could have said that. <laughs> now, 
as an act of Christian mercy, um, I will skip over uh, the issue of whether Christ was in fact an historical person. I will um, focus on what I take to be Christopher Hitchens' two main points. Um, one of them I want to say, uh, a gross uh, misunderstanding of my, of my opening argument, which was in no way the claim that Christianity or religion is the sole source of all morality in the world. In fact, where do we get morality? I said myself that if we want to figure out what's right or wrong, we get morality from the voice within. Conscience is, for each of us, the practical arbiter of morality. And of course, the atheist and the believer alike share conscience. The point I was trying to make was maybe a, a little different, and that is, it is one thing to say that the golden rule is universal, and quite another to say that within our civilization, this very important force called Christianity has had some very specific cultural impact. That's not to deny conscience. It's not to claim that in the absence of Christianity, there would be cannibalism and genocide. But we would be a very different civilization. How do we know that? Historically, ask yourself this question. Slavery is universal. Who can name an anti-slavery movement outside of Western civilization? Well, I can. There's always been one group opposed to slavery. That group has been called slaves. <laughs> but I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln's idea, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. That's remarkable. Lincoln doesn't want to be a slave. We know that. He doesn't want to be a master either. Or think about something else. If tomorrow there was a big famine in Rwanda or a tsunami swept the coast of Asia, what would happen? All the Western countries in unison would rise up. There would be cries of outrage, doctors without borders, the Red Cross, donations, missions, and so on. There are other rich countries in the world, the Muslim countries, now India, China. There would be a kind of great wall of silence. Why? Because in those cultures, this idea of universal brotherhood is not as much of an established value. When I was growing up as a kid in India, one of the proverbs we learned was the tears of strangers are only water. So it is quite a different point to say that Christianity has had a very specific impact. That was my point. Now I want to turn, if I may, how, how much time do I have left? A minute and a half to discuss this issue of the absentee God, raised <laughs> very much at the end. And I'll only be able to touch upon it, and I'll come back to it. I want to suggest that if we are evolved primates, Christopher Hitchens' view, we've been on the earth for 100,000 years, the problem that he states is far bigger a problem for his position than for mine. I've got to try to explain why God acts in the world as he does. He has a bigger problem. Think about it this way. If we're evolved primates, about the same size as we are now, with about approximately the same brain size we have now. Nobody claims that Homo sapiens has radically altered in this interregnum. History becomes a complete mystery. Because if you go into history class here at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and you say, I want to hear about human history, they say, let's begin with the Sumerians, 3500 BC. Then we'll move on to the Egyptians. In other words, history begins around the year 3000 BC. So my question is this, if we are evolved primates, about as smart as we are now, how is it the case from a completely secular point of view that Homo sapiens for the first 95,000 years of its history accomplished absolutely nothing? In other words, no wheel, no plow, no writing, and then suddenly mushrooms of civilization, the pyramids. And then the Cathedral of Chartres and the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and pretty soon we're on the moon and we're using iPhones. <laughs> it's almost as if human history is this great airplane trying to get off the ground. For 95,000 years, it goes up, bang, up, bang, up, bang. And then suddenly, mysteriously, about 3,000 years ago, take off. I might almost venture to suggest that it almost seems as if some transcendent creature leaned into the world, 
and breed some kind of a message or a soul into man, and suddenly, savage man became biblical man. And that seems to give almost a better explanation of this dramatic takeoff of human history than the lame assertion that we've been around for all this time, and only in the last 1% of our life did we start figuring out stuff. <laughs> and so it seems to me that we should be skeptics. But Christopher Hitchens is a one-way skeptic. He is skeptical of the claims of religion, but applies little skepticism to his own claims. Thank you very much. Well, done. well now, Mr. Chairman, um, I have to take back some of the nice things I was just saying right now. Uh, one of them has to do with the prearrangement. Um, I've heard him make that point about the bull's horns so many times now. Tonight was the lamest. I've also heard him try it on other people. I hope this is the last time I have to hear it. I noticed it didn't go down that well. It's because it's not that good. And he was also never at that rodeo. Um, to his second point, which I can scarcely believe I have heard made, let alone, and some of you should blush on your way home, let alone applauded. Yes, of course, the, the, the reason why civilization stopped being barbaric and why things, stuff started to happen was the arrival of monotheism. I mean to say, uh, there is a one-word refutation of that, I think. Um, you want to know what it is? You've guessed. <laughs> this is a university, China. When the first missionaries reached the emperor of Beijing, as he sat amid a civilization that dwarfed anything that Europe and the Middle East or Latin America, even at its height, had ever produced, he said, if what you are telling me is true, how has it taken so long to reach the people of China? No, I'm sorry. There are some arguments that just won't do and don't require any further refutation. The, 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 lost, the lost years, the lost millennia of the misery of, the, of human prehistory uh, have to be taken into account. And after all, uh, we were invited to touch upon them by Dinesh. Um, in considering the difference between antique and modern slavery. All right, I'm not going to reject a challenge like that. And slavery in antiquity was this. You lose, our civilization has conquered yours. You now work, you the victims, you work for us. You have machines from now on, you work under our lash, you build our, our system uh, for us, you build our walls, you dig our canals for, in return for our rations. Woe to the conquered. You can easily see how it happened. It is only with the arrival of religion that it is said in holy books that certain people are born as a race or people to be the masters and others to be dispensable, either to be slaughtered or when the, most of the slaughter is done for the remainder to be kept, often female, as slaves. Uh, in every holy book, from the original holy books of the Jewish people uh, through the uh, those wrongly adopted, in my view, by the uh, mistakenly adopted by the Christian religion, um, to the uh, Quran, to the Book of Mormon, uh, slavery is mandated, and those who are born into it, usually by a different colored skin, are clearly, plainly identified, usually as the sons of Ham, or some such nonsense, pseudo ethnological garbage. Okay, that's what's different. So, you. In the, waning, in the waning centuries of this foul system, it is true that some Christians, out of conscience, turned against it. Wilberforce is one of the best known. Uh, William, Lloyd William Lloyd Garrison, who later became a, a secular humanist, is, is another very famous case. Um, but it, it was never not the case, never not the case. And this is what Abraham Lincoln pointed out with such uh, irony and bitterness. It was never not the case that all the justifications for slavery were religious too. And that all the leaders of it, and all the profiteers of it, were taking their text and their authority from the Holy Scriptures. That's what you can't get over. And that's what you can't accuse the Babylonians and the Sumerians of doing. So my point remains exactly what it was. Not that religion doesn't make people behave better, because it quite plainly does not. But that there are things in it 
that no secularist would regard with other than the horror that we now reserve for things like cannibalism and slavery. The genital mutilation community, ladies and gentlemen, is exclusively, as far as I know, a religious one. The mutilation of the genitals of children, forcible mutilation of genitals, is entirely scripturally mandated. The suicide bombing community uh, in, among some Tamils in Sri Lanka may or may not be partly secular. It depends. Some of them are very extreme Buddhists. Um, and some of them quite extreme Hindus. But for the most part, the hideous idea of suicide murder is a, is a religious mandate, not just something that has religious authority, but is a commandment. People wouldn't do this if they didn't have faith. Um, I'll open our next session with a question. Uh, I'll make it my closing, because I think it's time for my closing. Uh, and I'll ask it not just to Dean Ash, but I'm hoping to leave all my questions in the minds of all present for this evening. There's a baby born tonight in Pakistan. Would you rather, from the point of view of ethics, morality, the advance of human civilization, uh, that this baby adopt my views of secular humanism, or that it become a Wahhabi Muslim baby? Because if you think that religion is good for people, I don't see why you don't say the second. And if you don't say the second, I think you ought to work out why you don't say the second. And if you prefer it over me, see me afterwards. Okay? Thank you. As uh, great as the conversation has been so far, it's about to get better because at this point, the gentlemen will go head to head and they'll oh. pose questions to each other. I'm back. And, uh, and this is going to be good. <clears throat> what was the preceding? You just, no, I know uh, you're kidding. No rules. All right. Bring it on. <laughs> I think I would agree with you um, if um, given the choice between um, the Hitchens philosophy or Wahhabi Islam, I'd, I'd have to go with you, Christopher, although by a fairly narrow margin. Uh, <laughs> but. I could easily turn that example on you and say, if you had to choose between someone adopting my philosophy or becoming one of Stalin's henchmen, trying to eliminate religion from the world and establish the worker's paradise, my point is you've got to compare like with like. You can't compare. One of the things that's very striking, and you see this very often, is that the worst manifestations of religion are compared to the greatest achievements of science. Nobody says, let's compare primitive religion to the science of Thales. It's always, let's compare the worst of religion to the best of science. Well, let's, we have, this is a questioning session, so we're going to go a little bit back and forth. Let me, let me pose a, a question to Christopher, uh, picking up this issue of whether or not Jesus is mythical, because you emphasized it with some, some ferocity. Um, do you believe that Alexander the Great was, in fact, a historical figure? Yes. Do you believe that Socrates was an historical figure? No. What about Aristotle? Um, we think that it's a sure thing that Aristotle was the uh, tutor in philosophy of Alexander of Macedonia. The figure of Socrates is, is not known to us except through descriptions of him by, I have to use the word, uh, later disciples. But it doesn't matter, you see, I can still say I'm for the Socratic method. Well, I, I think I no think nothing depends for me on the demonstration of his physical existence, it's a matter of any of ideas. No, the point I'm trying to get at here is this, and I'm, I'm trying to show the way in which you are, essentially you are essentially abandoning all canons of historical scholarship when it comes to the ancient world. You're applying a standard to Jesus that you'd never apply to other figures, which, I mean, I don't know if there's a philosopher in the world who considers Socrates to be entirely mythical. Uh, I, did, I don't I know if there's say, a... I didn't say that either. I said we have no... We have nothing that we could call historical proof of his existence. I'm not at all varying my rules. They're the same as they were the for point. the Nazarene question. We have pretty good historical proof. We have, we have Plato, we have Xenophon, we have Aristophanes. Why would all those guys make up Socrates when they are, some of them approaching him critically, some of them approaching him? So historians generally agree that there's no good reason to make up Socrates. But the reason that you've got to say he might have been made up 
is you're establishing essentially an impossible canon of historical verification. Most of the historical figures in the ancient world are attested to by one or two, or in, in Christ has probably more attestations than many other figures whose historicity you wouldn't doubt for a moment. Dinesh, I don't, I don't know why you're doing this to yourself. Um, <laughs> The, the existence, of, you, the existence of the Macedonian royal house is an archaeological question as well as among many others. It's decidable in innumerable ways. The, the, uh, the probability of there having been someone with the one name of Socrates is very high, but it can't be absolutely attested to, and it doesn't need to be, because those ideas would have been in someone else's mouth if they weren't in his. The idea, of, it's, it's surely as important to you that the physical existence of Jesus could be proved in a uh, rather different way, since he is the Son of God, and the Word made flesh, and born of a virgin, and by his death, we are all healed. So there's, you're, you've got a little bit more riding on this than not, not I do, and you've got no evidence for it. I... None. We're not. There is no well, evidence I may for have a lot. I may have a lot riding on the resurrection, and we're not talking about those things. We're really mm -hmm. saying, what you seem to be I'm saying... I'm sorry, but I am insisting on talking What you it. seem to be saying, even though we have not only... We have the Gospels, we have the Acts of the Apostles, we have the testimonies of Suetonius, Tacitus, Roman sources, Greek sources, sources, Jewish sources, including Josephus, then we have an early Christian movement following Christ that has no incentive to do so. They're in a persecuting Roman Empire. Many of them go to their debts uh, because of Christ, and you're saying they all went to it because of a made-up guy. That's historically preposterous, no, and not. most historians agree with me. The fact, the fact, the, the, willing, the willingness of, no, excuse me, the willingness of people to die for a rumor, or a delusion, or an illusion, is very well attested. That, 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 there's no element. There's never been, a, 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 alas, for our poorly evolved mammalian primate species, there's never been a period of history, however modern, where that won't happen. Look at how many people are still willing to do this for Joseph Smith, for example. Or for, or for a, a deluded epileptic called Muhammad, a, pl a plagiarist of, the, of some of the foregoing. I, I, I repeat, if you, if you will accept this for one, will you not accept it for all? Or must, or are you not obliged to accept it for all? Are not all these prophets and revelations equally valid or equally false? My position is at least unintelligible. Let's come to your um, question about... I'm um, <laughs> let me ask you about the question about religion um, poisoning everything. And I want to read a list of a few, a few names. Dante. Did religion poison Dante? Did religion poison Shakespeare? Did religion poison Milton? Did religion poison Bach? Did religion poison Handel? Did re religion poison Michelangelo? What about Bernini? What about the guys who did the Gothic cathedrals? Yes or no? Um, yes to Dante, um, made him waste a, a lot of his talent on descriptions of hell. Uh, very, very, very gloating, very poorly written uh, sadistic accounts of what happened to people who he didn't agree with. That was a, a real waste of his what talent. What about Shakespeare? Was he um, in the same league, ruined by no, religion? No, no, with Shakespeare, well, I, I'm, I'm forced to the belief that if he wasn't himself a secret Catholic, um, he was probably from a, a closet uh, Catholic family, and that there are, there's, uh, there's uh, some intriguing evidence in his work um, of the practice of the, of the ancient mass and so forth, and that that's, that's worth knowing, but it uh, neither adds nor subtracts anything to his uh, talent, and that when someone writes, uh, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. You want to ask two things. One, who is this person of whom Shakespeare is jealous? Who is this man he wishes he was? Who, who is the man who has so many more talents, more friends than him? And second, he got it right about deaf heaven and troubling it with his bootless cries. He knew what despair was. He knows that the realization that you must begin with is that the heavens are empty and that we have to deal with each other here on earth, and this is the only life we have. Otherwise, we wouldn't need Shakespeare. Christopher, we this could, is we why... We have the holy books. 
Do you want to go on through all the architects and poets? I'm willing to do no, it. No, no, but this is why you are such a charming evader. Because my point <laughs> is that you, Shakespeare's, Did I evade moral, the question about Dante Shakespeare? Shakespeare's moral universe is inconceivable without Christianity. The strength of it is he gives voice to different views within that universe. You isolate a view from one character, impute it to Shakespeare, and imply that Shakespeare somehow transcends... No, excuse me, the, the person I was just quoting was Shakespeare. That's one of his sonnets. Uh, it's, yes. not, it's not a character from a play, as you should know. The sonnets it's are It's him all... reflecting upon his own condition. Now, In my life, of... I, I'm willing to admit, my, life, my own life, which is mainly devoted to the question of language, is... Um, inconceivable without, say, the King James version of the Bible, sometimes not by the Aquinas group, but by, the, by others called the authorized version of the Bible. Um, and by the Cranmer prayer book, which falls somewhere on the Protestant Catholic frontier, and other things. I, I couldn't um, imagine my life without being able to call upon verses and staves of this, uh, or in fact without being visited by them when I didn't even call, on, call upon them. But that doesn't mean that my morality comes from that or that I need the permission of the church by law established in Canterbury to uh, think moral thoughts. Or, my immoral, point is one, that the or son, immoral ones if it comes to that. My, the point you're missing is not the King James Bible, but the sonnets have narrative voices behind them. Some of them are said by a young man. Some of them seem to be said in a homosexual tone. Others are clearly heterosexual. So in literature, because someone wrote a sonnet, that doesn't mean it's their opinion. But it's your turn to ask me a question. Ah. <laughs> well, you know that, I mean, I suppose one of the things that most, most upsets and depresses and alarms and nauseates secular humanists is the sectarianism or any appeal to it. In other words, I didn't want Rick Warren at the inauguration, not just because of his apparent... <laughs> not just because he's a boring, fat dunce and so on, but because... Um, <laughs> and not because he's not inclusive enough about gay people, because he doesn't have to be inclusive about that if he doesn't, but because he was openly willing to say to a Jewish woman who asked him in public, could she too go to heaven or come to heaven? No, you can't. Now, he, I don't see how he can't say that. Um, I'm prefacing, I'm throat clearing Dinesh in this way because I, I want to ask you something. And, I, and I, it's another question I want to lodge in the minds of others present here this evening. To be a Roman Catholic is not to believe that religion is a good idea, right? Or that God is a good thing, or that the Bible contains some true stories. It's, it is to believe those things too, but it is to hold the belief that if you're not a Roman Catholic, you're not going to be saved. Now, so I'm asking you, and we now have a, new, uh, now a fresh occupant of the uh, Holy See, Mr. Ratzinger, as he'll always be to me, um, who is increasingly determined to restore the doctrine of um, ex ecclesia nulla salus, that there is not just a, the church, but there's one church, one true church. Well, I'm going to ask you anyway, uh, and you must have asked yourself, and I'm going to ask everyone else present to, for their consideration, do you think that's true or not? Uh, I think it is not true, and uh, I, don't, I think it is also, not only is it not true, it is actually not the Catholic position. Uh, and Stand up, that man. And to, and to go even further, the, look, I, I don't even think, I, I think you've got to be careful here, because... Um, I was trying of, to be. Even from an evangelical point of view, you mentioned Rick Warren, and... Um, the, even if someone takes the Bible for what it says, literally, I'm not a biblical literalist, but even if you were, the Bible says really, very clearly that G Jesus is the way, in fact, the only way to salvation. But there's a second proposition that is often confused with that, and that is everyone in the world, whether they lived before Jesus or whether they lived in other cultures, but if they have not positively accepted Jesus Christ, they are going to hell. There are two groups of people who infer this. One is a certain type of extreme and ignorant fundamentalist. And the second is a certain type of equally ignorant atheist. Both read the Bible the same way. Uh, 
and draw from it conclusions that are actually neither stated in scripture nor in fact the position of either, either the Catholic or the Protestant churches. Well, we'll, we'll explore that further, but I... I well, I, I was going to say, not my problem, but I was rather amazed to have elicited such enthusiasm from people clapping, saying, no, the church has never claimed to be the one true church. I mean, you can clap that if you like, but it doesn't seem to me to be historically true. Anyway, it's nothing to me. I just wanted to know which side of it you took, but you don't seem to have it's everyone with you. It's not a matter of taking you. sides. In Catholicism, there is something in other words, called well, the development well, all right. of doctrine. I'll, all right. I'll phrase, so even if you can show it was believed in the I'll third century the, A.D., it doesn't follow it's the Catholic position. Well, people used to lose their lives on these propositions. So let's not be frivolous about them. Then, if you want me I'm to not. be ecumenical, I'll be ecumenical then. Do, do, you, do you think that it is better to be, um, more likely to lead to your salvation, to be a Christian than another kind of monotheist? Of course I believe that. Oh, can I ask you on what grounds that your superior claim rests, that it makes you better than a Muslim or a Jew? Um, certainly. Uh, give me a minute to, to lay it out. But by uh, all means. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to, I'm going to tie my hand behind the back by um, doing it in purely secular terms. Um, let me start with a proposition I think no one is in this room would disagree with. Things in the world are not what they ought to be. Anyone disagree with that? No. That means we live on two levels, don't we? We live on the, this is the level of the way things are. Let's call it the human level. But we all know that there is a second level. That's the way things ought to be. Let's just, perfect goodness, perfect beauty, truth, and so on. So you have these two levels. Let's call them for a moment the human level and the divine level. Now, all the religions in the world are aimed at trying to ask how can this chasm between the human level and the divine level be bridged. You ask about Judaism and Islam, so I'll refer to those two. The Eastern religions have one solution. I'll set it aside for a moment. Judaism and Islam jointly believe, and I say jointly, they believe it in slightly different ways, but the solution is similar, that the way for this chasm to be closed is for human beings to build a certain kind of a, a ladder from man to God. What is the shape of this ladder? When in, in Islam it's the five pillars. Pray five times a day, observe Ramadan, do charity, go to Mecca. In Judaism it may be different. Diet, dietary regulations and so on. But the idea is these are human efforts to ascend to God. Christianity is different, maybe not better, but it certainly is different in declaring this project wonderful and noble but impossible. That this human effort, however gallant, cannot close this enormous gap. If the gap is to be closed, now maybe as an atheist you say it can't be closed, but if it is to be closed, the Christian belief is it has to be done from the other side. In some mysterious way, God has got to condescend to the human level, and that's the role that Christ plays. He's the emissary, if you will, from God to man. Now, notice that here I'm, I haven't appealed to scripture, I haven't quoted the book of Leviticus or the Gospel of Matthew. I've given in my own best way a certain anthropological account of the human problem, I've given uh, the ways in which different solutions are proposed, and I leave it to you to examine which solution is the most plausible. I'm saying the Christian view seems to me to make the most sense. If indeed this great uh, gap can be closed, it seems to me that it has to be closed the Christian way. The other way can make progress, but even though good, it isn't going to be good enough. Fantastic. So you'd make a really good Muslim in that the, the main profession of faith, the only real profession of faith a Muslim has to make is there is one God and his messenger, his emissary, the cross of the gap, is the Prophet Muhammad. Hmm. I mean, you, you have just as, as perfectly stated that, restated it, as one could have wished. I wish you joy I'm of it. I'm sorry, you're, you're... I wish you joy of it. Well, I, I, I mean, either I didn't hear you or you have just issued a whopping non sequitur, so I'll give you, you the benefit of repeating that, it. Which you is said a, that, a perfect point You said point that the gap could only segue. be closed if God sent an emissary. That's what makes Christianity different. I appeal to the audience. Did I misstate that? Did he not say that? Did you not say that? I did say it, and yeah. you, but... What is the profession of faith of Islam? There is but one God, and Muhammad is his messenger to us. That's all you need to be a Muslim. Here, if I can briefly answer, then we'll go to questions. Do you think Islam is man-made or God-made? Do you think that God spoke through us to Muhammad, or that only Muslims are under this wrong impression? That God's only appeared to us once here let me give the, the Nazarene. Here let me give the Muslim answer, which is that Muhammad was solely a man. 
That's not my answer. That's the Islamic answer. Islam is different from Christianity. In Islam, Muhammad is in no way considered to be God's special messenger. Muhammad is believed to be the illiterate and unworthy recipient of Allah's revelation. He does in no way occupies the same position in Islam as Christ does in Christianity. So um, the equivalence that you're suggesting between Christ and, and, and Muhammad is simply wrong. It's crossing the gap in the same direction though, isn't it? Surely. It, you said that the gap had to be crossed not by humans building up towards heaven, but heaven coming down towards us. Well, quite plainly, the Quran is the same in that respect. I'm asking you a different question now. I'm saying, do you think that those who believe that God ventriloquized himself through the archangel Gabriel, oddly enough, uh, through this illiterate, that's a, a, a true statement, that that did happen, might have happened, could have happened, or didn't happen? I don't believe it did happen, but the point I'm trying to make that you're missing, obviously I don't accept the revelations of other religions, but the point I'm trying to make here <laughs> is that the Islamic solution is radically different from the Christian one. Whatever Allah's revelation to Muhammad, it was not vicarious atonement. It was not the Same idea direction. that God is closing the gap. It was rather that human beings have these social and legal and uh, civic duties. In other words, in, in Christianity, you have the idea, for example, that morality is intentional. If you've contemplated the sin, Christ says, in a sense, you've committed it. In Islam, it's very different. Thought the, crime. The, one second. The, the mullah thought doesn't... Thought crime. Totalitarianism again. Thought crime. Uh, whether we, know it is or not. we know what you're thinking, and we can punish you for it. Totalitarianism <laughs> defined. Tyranny defined. Thought crime. It, it, it you said might... it for me. It, it might be a thought crime. Christ says, Christ says nothing about punishing one's thoughts. Christ basically is simply defining the nature of sin. Our legal system is based on the idea that, 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 that offenses rely in part on the intention. That's why a first degree murder is different from a crime of passion, for example. That's another example of the way that Christianity has shaped our legal culture. Uh, uh, so, uh, No one comes to the Father except by me. That's not judging you on what you think. But it's, it's one thing to say, it's one thing to say that Christ is the means by which people get to heaven. And it's quite another thing to say that everyone who hasn't explicitly accepted Christ is damned. In fact, the Bible itself disputes that. In the book of Luke, we know that Abraham, Abraham is said to be in heaven. Well, Abraham lived before Christ. He obviously didn't accept Christ, and yet he's in heaven. So the Bible itself confutes your assertion that a positive no, no, affirmation no, no, of Christ no, is no, a prerequisite no, for salvation. No, no, no. The Bible is incoherent. That's a quite different statement. Well, you're just choosing the parts the that Bible you is, can... The Bible is thoroughly, thoroughgoingly, through and through, incoherent. That doesn't make me inconsistent. Not inconsistent, only selective. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, on that note, I'm feeling a little like Gwen Eiffel here. You know? But uh, why don't we do this? Uh, a round of applause for both, both gentlemen, and we'll go to questions from the audience. Fantastic. As I mentioned earlier, both gentlemen have given up some of their time so we'd have more time for questions. We'd ask the questioners to be as focused, precise as you possibly can and uh, put it in the form of a question, please. Sir? Very nice. Deferring, sir? Thank you, gentlemen, both uh, for your wonderful remarks tonight. Uh, my question may be an entirely whole new debate. I'd like to hear both of you respond, but in particular, Mr. Hitchens, I address this question to you if I can't get response from both. Um, Mr. Hitchens, how would you define or delimit what we mean by a person and what is our innate duty to another person? Well, I think the word individual is a well-chosen word for our description. In other words, you can't, you can't boil it down any further. However much you talk about the society, the tribe, the species, and so forth, you're stuck with the fact that it has to be made up of members are a bit more than atoms, so individual is a person, someone who can't be further subdivided. Hope that will meet your rather bizarre question, I have to say. <laughs> the second is, um, how do we know what our duties to one another are? Well, the, w what we know is that uh, without a certain 
Solidarity is my preferred word for it, without an understanding that there's a common interest as well as one's own raging individual uh, demands and needs, which have, have always been understood at all times to be, in any, the case of any one person, insatiable, that unless these can be married in, in some way uh, to a concept of the, of the common good, then the enterprise isn't possible. And if this wasn't true, then of course we couldn't have had a human society over primitive to begin with. And the same conclusion is observable among uh, other primates who have families, tribes, kinship, and so on, and, and some other mammals too. There's no reason to suppose that evolution has given us any special privileges in exchange for our recognition of these facts. Thank you. Left, uh, can we each take a Please. brief? Um, left unanswered is the issue of how evolved primates develop either individualism or solidarity. Uh, I've watched the Nature Channel a few times and I don't see much of either. Uh, so that, uh, it seems to me that there's a missing element here and I think Jefferson, who was, by the way, a man of the Enlightenment, not a particularly devout Christian, nevertheless asked, where do we as individuals get inalienable rights? In other words, where are the obligations, the mutual obligations to each other? Where do those come from? And he could have said any number of things, but he, found he could think of only one. The unalienable rights are ours because we are created, we have a creator. That's where they come from. Uh, and I think to this day, we haven't had a better source of rights uh, and of these individual dignities that Christopher Hitchens takes for granted, but makes no effort to ground. Okay, then I, I'll have to, if you don't mind, because as a minor, minor a member of the Jefferson Biographer Club. I'll, I'll just have to say what I think about that. It is true that the Declaration speaks of inalienable rights from, from a, a creator. Um, but in my opinion, this is a negation of what had been up till then the only way right was ever mentioned, which was that there was a divine right of kingship. If you recall, that's what was being overthrown. Had already been overthrown in part in Britain. It was being overthrown in the United States. The, the, the claim of the king to have his authority from the creator was false. Now, if that claim is false, and I believe that it is, there is no divine right of kings, you can do one of two things. You can either say, well, if there, is, if there are rights, then everyone should have them and claim them from the creator, which is a sort of tautology. Or you can say that rights don't come from a creator, that they are innate in us and in our species, and we'll get the ones we fight for and defend. We won't get the ones we don't, and most of the time, we're defending these rights against theocracy. If I, may I be offered just one thought? Um, I think you are right that Jefferson is opposing divine right, but here's the truly profound thing. Rather than deny divine right completely, Jefferson makes a very different move. He transfers divine right from the one to the many. In other words, Jefferson shows by his statement that he agrees with divine right, but the divine right is not conferred on the monarch. It is conferred on the people as a whole. Well, but that's precisely the, the error I was just identifying. If you can suck one right out of your thumb and call it divine, why can't you say, well then, uh, oysters have the same right, that it comes from their creator. There is no, as you, as you yourself have pointed out, with the rights industry, no real limit to this, especially if you attribute it to the divine. Generally speaking, though, the struggle for rights is a struggle for humans to assert themselves against other humans who want to oppress them in the name of God. Do you mean, sir, that we do not have an... Well, it's me again, the questioner. Yes, sir. Do you mean then... You suddenly seemed a little... What shall I say? <laughs> Omniscient? It, it just came from somewhere else. It's, it gave me a nasty turn. <laughs> yes, please, go ahead. Do you mean then that we do not have any innate rights towards each other other than what we assert by force? Did I hear you right? Or did I hear you wrong? I, I, I tend to agree with those who've said that the concept of right, of recht, is a human creation, uh, that it's, it's an arbitrary creation, yes. Um, and that we, we'd be better to say that we get the ones we fight for, that we don't get the ones we don't, and that our duties are, and solidarities with each other are mandated by evolution um, and are not uh, in any sense predicated on anything supernatural.
Thank you. Sir? Yeah, uh, my question is looking a little bit more forward. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier, imagine if Jesus Christ was not, had been proven to no longer be God or God's son. Um, imagine, if you will, a future where science is accepted as a total dogma of thought and reason is the ultimate arbiter. Um, in that world, would humanity not find its own ways to tribalize again and have its own strife? There's a TV show, South Park has a funny episode about this, where they actually say, in the future, they fight over science as opposed to fighting over God. And in, for you, Mr. D'Souza, in the same way, in a world without God, is it really so unimaginable? I mean, is there a possible way? Could you imagine a future without it in the sense of humanity still being humans? And I'd also be remiss to say, um, in the great tradition of these debates, is it possible that you gentlemen might be able to go to a pub after this and continue over beers? I'd be happy to buy. <laughs> On the second point, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, Chris, a, well, I think it's a certain as anything can be that I'll be in a bar. And I'll <laughs> G Dinesh quite often, uh, and I, Dinesh and his wife have often joined me there. The, on your point, I, there's, my view of the mammalian evolution of our species is, is, the, is that we are programmed to be superstitious. Religion is unvanquishable, un unbanishable, as long as we're partly rational, as long as our prefrontal lobes are too small, our adrenaline glands are too large, uh, and our opposing thumbs are still too clumsy. Of course, people can be sold every kind of of delusion. I half agree with G.K. Chesterton when he said that people don't believe in God. They don't believe in nothing but in anything. I, I believe that the belief in God is a belief, willingness to believe in anything. But if you take orthodox religion away, you may very well find someone worshipping a pet rock or a tame fish or a, a crystal or some new age nonsense uh, uh, healing process. Yeah, that's the way a lot of people are. There, I just would like to say that there are there's a solid minority of us who are not impressed by any of this. And we're citizens too. Um, and deserve that much respect. A tiny thing, just to reignite our, uh, the disagreement that Dinesh and I have. He said science is based on reason. I don't think that's absolutely necessarily true because humans aren't based on reason. Uh, Newton, for example, believed that the Catholic Church was antichrist and that only Protestantism was true and that the Trinity meant that you shouldn't be allowed to teach at Cambridge University if you believed in it, for example. Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen and carbon monoxide, believed in the phlogiston theory. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace, Darwin's great collaborator, and maybe progenitor, was never happier than going to a spiritualist seances. A lot of these religious people, uh, scientific minds were terrific crackpots. It's not until Einstein, really, that you get something like pure mind as a scientific expression. I would prefer to say that science bases itself on evidence as well as reason, and that's the missing term in Christianity and Islam and Judaism and the rest of it. A, a, a good scientist will say, here's what I'll tell you now in advance would prove me wrong. Here's what I think is the case. But if you find this, I'll tell you now, I'll climb down. So for evolution, um, Help. there is no religious believer who can, there is no religious believer who can do you that service, who can say to you, show me this and I'll stop believing. It's never been done in the nature of the thing it couldn't be done. The E word for religious people is essentially meaningless. It's occasionally convenient. Sometimes they think they'd like some evidence, usually in the form of miracles, because faith always turns out to be not quite enough. Let's have a bit of evidence, a tiny bit. Uh, I, forget, I forget what scientists said. Little... Scientists of evolution said, okay, what would, what would make you stop, what would make you say you were wrong. Um, rabbit bones in the Precambrian veil. That would do it. Find me a rabbit bone there. It's all over. <laughs> the debates between Dawkins and Gould on punctuated evolution, for example, are as, as intense as any debate has ever been between schismatic Catholics, Protestants, Sunni and Shia Muslims, or anything of this sort, except that they're all decidable on evidence as well as reason. That's what makes all the difference. All, all the difference. Okay. Here's the problem with that statement. There are the biggest questions of life. Uh, who are we? Um, why are we here? Um, why is there a universe? Uh, what's our purpose? What comes after death? 
These questions, if you think about it, are in some senses as much in the dark as they have been since the time of the Babylonians. Science has left them completely unanswered and untouched. This is why the philosopher Wittgenstein said that even if all possible scientific questions have been answered, the main problems in life remain. So what do we do with issues that are of vital importance to us, but not susceptible to the kind of empirical evidence that Christopher Hitchens demands? For example, how do we know if there's life after death? We don't. We, none, neither, none of us have met a dead guy. What possible empirical test could That's we devise? That's not what you say. One that's, second. That's not let me what finish. You you, you've been going on a bit, so let me let me have my turn. Um, um, All right. If you'll agree that dead people don't come back, I'll I'll, let, I'll hold it right there. <laughs> I didn't think that was your view. The point I'm trying to make is this. It's all I no, could hope no, for. No possible, no possible empirical test can resolve the question of whether there's an afterlife. <clears throat> so, in the absence of evidence, I believe that there is an afterlife on faith. In the absence of evidence, Christopher Hitchens does not believe that there's an afterlife. The difference between us is not that he knows and I don't, or I know and he doesn't. He is laboring under the delusion that his position is based on reason and my position is based on faith, when the truth of it is, neither of us know, both of us are guessing, both our positions are based on faith, and he would do well to have the honesty to admit that. There's a strong clap anything faction here tonight. <laughs> Um, it's <laughs> apparently, even I can appeal to it. Um, since, you the since, you just, since, you, since you just said to me and to the audience, and I think it's so recent, so moments ago that people will remember it, you believe that on faith, the afterlife, and I don't. Then you say, we're the same, because we're just as faith-based as each other. Um, that's what got the applause. I would just like to say that I think that that's a an unholdable, untenable uh, position. If I say that, given that there's absolutely no evidence, which you also rather too willingly conceded, uh, that you're ever likely again to see a dead person or be re reunited with one, that I decide that on that basis, that absolutely no exceptions basis, I doubt an exception will be made in my own case, um, I don't think my position is faith-based at all. I think it is somewhat evidence-derived, if I would say that, only for myself. Gentlemen, let's clap all you like. Let's try to get in uh, as many questions as we can. We'd ask that the next round of questions come from students in particular. We'll try to get everybody in. Um, the woman in the red. Oh, uh, my question was just in regards to a couple of the points that you made, Mr. Hitchens. Um, in light of the first point, that if certain historical figures weren't to exist, um, Jesus and Mohammed, and that would lead us you know, to a belief in atheism, most likely, um, or you, you mentioned that we wouldn't necessarily become thieves or murderers if those historical figures didn't exist. I'm curious that, um, you know, if a belief, if a lack of belief in God were not to convince me to become a thief or a murderer. Isn't it also true that, um, you know, people commit abuses, such as the religious mandates you mentioned, such as circumcision, et cetera, in the name of Christianity every day? Doesn't that not necessarily change the objective meaning of the cross? And if it does, isn't atheism responsible for thievery and murder? Even the clap anything faction had a slight... <laughs> False start there, I think. <laughs> they knew where you, what you wanted of me, but um, I don't. Um, how would this change the meaning of the cross? I, I throw myself on your mercy. I don't understand the grammar of the question. My basic point is that if, under your understanding of atheism, atheism is not responsible for thievery and murders that you know, result from lack of belief in God, then isn't it also true that people who commit abuses in the name of the cross, in the name of Christianity, those abuses don't change the objective meaning of the cross or the heart of Christianity. It depends what authority they think they're obeying. I mean, if the Pope says you must go on crusade 
and this is a war for God, and you, you will be rewarded in paradise if you undertake it. If you believe what the Pope says, I think it's not inconsistent with being a Christian, as I understand it, um, you are, to me, responsible for all the crimes you thereupon commit. I'm not going to uh, claim more for atheism than it will bear. I mean, you can be an atheist, and you can be a psychopath. You can be an atheist and be a sadist. You can be an atheist and be a fascist. It's actually quite, quite uncommon, that the latter. Most, most fascists actually were Catholics. But you can be, a, you can be a, an atheist and be a Stalinist. In fact, it's almost mandatory, the, the, the other way around. All, it's, all it says is, you don't believe in God. Now, I don't, some people think there shouldn't be a special word for it. I don't believe in the tooth fairy either, or in Santa Claus. I don't have a special word for saying I don't believe that. But wasn't your... There doesn't need, it doesn't need to be a special ontological category. But, but Dinesh is right, and we've actually both stated this in different ways. The, the original arguments, what is the good, what is the bad, what are our duties to each other, is there a point to our existence? The questions of philosophy. Religion is foss fossilized philosophy, in my view, but it is still philosophy, um, with most of the questions left out or claimed to be answered. Um, must be asked. Question from the back, please. May I, may oh, I take a quick shot then. at it? Hold on, please, All right. Dinesh. Um, see, I think, uh, Christopher, I must say, I, I think you are, in this debate, not rising to the seriousness of the issue. When you say religion is the same as the tooth fairy, look, I didn't say that. Many of the, you said I should no more credit it uh, empirically than I would credit the tooth fairy. I, I, sorry, I said I don't have a special word for saying I don't believe in the tooth fairy. I do have a special word, which I own to, for saying why I'm an atheist or I don't believe in religion. The point I'm trying to get is this. If one makes a list of the greatest scientists of all time, a list that would surely include Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Boyle, Leibniz, Pascal, Faraday, Newton, you would find that the vast majority of them believe in God. If you made a list of the greatest philosophers of all time, a list that would surely include Plato, Augustine, Boethius, Aquinas, Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, Kant, uh, Kierkegaard, Hegel, they believed in God. So for you now, writer for Vanity Fair, to say all of this is an illusion and dismiss it without taking it seriously seems to me intellectually a little bit shameful, don't you think so? Well then. I just said, first, I'm beginning to narrow down the HQ of this uh, faction. Um, I mean, do you, do you know more science? I, 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 I took particular care to say that I don't, I don't have a way, in a, in a word, of saying why I don't believe in tooth fairies or any other kind of fairies or anything of the supernatural. But, but with religion, I say that it's, it's like engaging with philosophy, except philosophy frozen by dogma. Thus. All the original arguments we have are to do with whether or not there's been a supernatural intervention in these questions or not. I also took particular care to say, before you did, that a great number of scientists were, were uh, subject to one form or another of, of religious belief. In the case of the greatest one you instance, Sir Isaac Newton, one who thought that your church was the work of the devil. For example, your problem, not mine. <laughs> I don't read Newton for his theological opinions. Newton thought that if you could find the true measurements of the temples in ancient Rimen and so forth, you'd know more than you could if you would measured the gravitational field. I don't agree with him. He wouldn't be remembered if that's what he was remembered for. Or he'd be remembered as a crackpot. Same with Alfred Russell Wallace being a spiritualist. However, yes, you're right. I would give, I'd give a page of Spinoza for any of those people when it comes, or of, or of David Hume, for any of those people when it comes to reasoning whether or not we are objects of supernatural guidance and divine intervention. You give a page I maintain that I'm, for Plato, I'm and Locke, and Locke, and Locke, and Kant combined. And I, I maintain that we are not, and that it's a good thing that we are not, because if we were, we would be living under a celestial dictatorship, from which there would be no appeal. That would mean our lives were essentially servile. Now, is that plain? Not, not, is it, not do you agree, but is it at least plain what I say and how I say it? Sab. Go to our friend in the mezzanine. Um, my question is to both of the uh, speak, speech, uh, speakers. Does religion provide a survival advantage? And I, either one. And if you, if you do think it provides a survival <coughs> advantage, that implies it's a purely a construct of, of the human mind. And, and I mean, it, I think you, you can argue both sides, and it, it, it might lead you to um, a, a, a 
problem? Well, I do think that religion provides a survival advantage, but it in no way follows that religion is untrue. I think that reason provides a survival advantage. We developed large brains, for example, to elude uh, woolly mammoths and so on, uh, or at least uh, the challenges of uh, nature. Uh, and yet, that doesn't mean reason is untrustworthy. Uh, as a means of uh, 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 doing logic or trying to understand planetary rotations and so on. So religion could be both a source of solidarity, which it clearly is. Look, the vast majority of people from the beginning of history in all cultures have been religious. So from a Darwinian point of view, you have to concede that religion has a powerful survival advantage. Now earlier, a young lady asked a question that was treated as silly when she was talking about lying and stealing. But I think the deeper import of that question is this. Religion is ultimately a reason for hope in the idea of cosmic justice. And what I mean by that is that life is very unfair. We, we believe in justice and we say oh, what goes around comes around and stuff like that. But we know it's not true, right? Many times the bad guy ends up on top and many times the good guy comes to grief. So all the religions of the world are in some senses asserting that that may be the terrestrial uh, word on things, but it's not the final word. I mean, look at Hinduism. If you are a lousy guy in this life, hey, we're going to be seeing you as a cockroach in the next life. <laughs> Cosmic justice. So the survival advantage of religion is multiple. I mean, number one, it is the sole tested means of transmitting morality to the young. Right? In every culture, if you ask someone, where did you learn about right and wrong? He says, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Hindu. Now, true, we can probably do it by philosophy, but I've yet to meet a guy who says, I got my morality from Hegel. <laughs> so we can talk all we want about philosophy, but the truth of it is religion has delivered the goods as being the transmission belt of conveying morality. What about hope in life and a sense of purpose? When there was the Virginia Tech massacre, how come that secular campus suddenly became a kind of cathedral? in which everyone was invoking consolation and God. Uh, in other words, uh, my point is religion by giving a sense of purpose and meaning to life, by ultimately answering the large questions that science has proved radically incapable of even entertaining. I mean, science doesn't even ask why there is a universe and only purports to describe how we got a universe. So science is answering, in this case, a very different question than the one posed by religion. So if you imagine two tribes, a secular tribe that basically says we're descended from the amoebas, we've come from nowhere, we're going nowhere, morality is stuff we make up as we go along, and another group of people who believe we're the special creation of God, history has a purpose, your life has a purpose, that even if no one else loves you, there's a God who loves you, and that there is an eternal life to reward the just, which of those two camps is more likely to survive and, and prosper? Uh, Dinesh was doing very well um, for the first half of that, and I completely agree with him. My, my friend and ally, uh, Daniel Dennett, in his book on belief in belief, says that he thinks it's extremely likely that uh, religious faith uh, gave people advantages of survival. And if you go to the witch doctor and you think he is a real doctor, everyone knows that there's an element of morale involved in, in recovery, and it may be a very small advantage based on an illusion, but it, these are areas where even a tiny advantage may may indeed help. Um, however, rather than confine himself to that, Dinesh goes on to say, but wouldn't it be nice if it was true what the witch doctor said? It just, you just heard him say it. I mean, after all, you'd feel a huge amount better if there was uh, life everlasting as a reward for virtue. And, well, that's <coughs> known as wish thinking. Um, I phrase it like this, so I'll take up your Jefferson challenge again, if you like. Um, Thomas Jefferson says in notes on the state of Virginia about the slavery question, he says, I tremble for my country when I reflect, you've all read it, that God is just. If you haven't read it, you'll remember I said it. You'll, you'll go and read it now. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. Who can forget? But if there is a just God, what is there to tremble about? Why if there's I a God who really loves you, and knows that you're there, and cares for you, and looks out for you, and is interested in how you're getting on, and how you're going to get on, and wants the best for you. What is, what is a small question like slavery? 
all your, all your feelings of responsibility and care about that are dissolved. You're bathed in the refulgence of an absolutely wonderful thing. Uh, well, maybe, the, the, only, um, the only price of it would be, unfortunately, because nothing comes without a price, you'd have to submit to a celestial dictatorship. But hey, what's that in return for a ton of love? Well, I'll answer your question uh, very briefly. Why, did, why was Jefferson trembling? Well, Jefferson was a slave owner. He owned about 200 slaves. And um, he never freed any of them before his death. He understood, he didn't have to be told, the tremendous innate power of human selfishness. You don't need theology to explain the slave owner. Um, slavery is rooted in human selfishness. Jefferson knew that and how powerful that was. He trembled that that instinct, so rooted and so powerful, would prevail over what Lincoln would later call the better angels of our nature. So he trembled because man, although he knows better, is inclined to pick ultimately the, in the short term the more profitable, the more convenient choice, but ultimately the terrible choice. Gentlemen, we only have about 10 minutes before Father Kevin comes back up and declares the winner. So why don't we try to get as many students as we can. Okay, Sir, very, very, very quick, Jefferson did free the ones who he'd fathered, and he did free their mother. <laughs> he freed the ones who looked like him. In okay. the mezzanine. I'm gonna ask this question, Run, because I'm from CSU. <laughs> this is for Hitchens. You said it is not unusual for people to die for a myth in reference to uh, the Muslims and the Christians. However, uh, don't historians generally agree that all the 12 disciples were martyred and killed, 11 of them? And wouldn't it be much more strange for first generation Christians to be tortured when they know it's a lie? It uh, doesn't challenge what I said at all. I take it as a comment. No, there's no historian who would say that, by the way. No. It's not, these things are not historically established. No one ever died for anything they knew to be a lie. Even if you think of the Islamic uh, radicals, uh, they are dying for an imagined knew, promise. I didn't, say, I didn't say they knew it to be a lie. I said the whole story is a legend. But if the whole story is a legend, then the early Christians having no basis for it... May have been under another impression. I can't know the subjective views of somebody else. I don't, it's the same as someone saying they saw the stigmata. If I wasn't there, I can't say to them, they didn't. I can only say I think it's much more likely they were under misapprehension. Exactly. Well, we're talking about plausibility of motive here. And, yes. you know, for example, Paul, in discussing the issue of Christ's death, says that he has 500 witnesses. He says some of them are dead, but some of them are alive. And this is, by the way, in a book written about 30 years after the crucifixion. So my point is we're talking about historical documents in historical time, and we're trying to attach motives and plausibility to them. I also want to point out, you mentioned a moment ago, wishful thinking. Somebody asked me about the survival advantage, and so I answered in those terms. But I do want to point out that wishful thinking is always punished in evolutionary terms. From an evolutionary point of view, it makes absolutely no sense to entertain a set of beliefs about the afterlife that are, in fact, illusionary. To see this, imagine two rabbits, one of which is, you might say, the religious rabbit, and the other is the atheist rabbit and they are both being pursued by a lion. The atheist rabbit goes, I have only one life to live, I better run like hell. The religious rabbit goes, I got another life waiting for me that's even better. Which rabbit is more likely to survive? Point I'm trying to make is from an evolutionary point of view, religion is very expensive. People who are much poorer than we are built pyramids and cathedrals. They invested a lot of money in this. My point is, why would these things survive if they were illusions? Why wouldn't evolution encourage atheist points of view to survive? Because they are based on a more hard-headed assessment of the world in front of us. That's a good question. Um, one, um, answering it in reverse, and assuming the question is to me, and trying not to take up too much time, the, the huge majority of people in the educated, uh, developed world have become at least secular. Uh, you can certainly uh, plot it along a graph of, of development that, that church attendance, religious fundamentalism, all these kind of things have declined as we've uh, evolved in that sense, if you want to put it that 
that crudely. The second, though, is that I don't think that these, there are certain lessons that are not transmissible. Um, uh, just as you said that religion only, only religion can, can uh, provide morality to children, a very dangerous proposition, I think people will agree if they think about it. Anyone who does think it might want to look at Mary McCarthy's memoirs of a Catholic girlhood, for example, when she was told by her priests at the age of nine that her favorite uncle was going straight to hell because he was a Protestant. That's not teaching children morality. Uh, but, the, <clears throat> but that, and morality is teachable to children, I can tell you, I've seen it done. I won't say I've done it myself, but I've seen it done without recourse to the supernatural. Um, but that certain lessons have to be learned by each generation each time. Every generation has superstitions to combat. There will always be people who afresh will believe in ghosts, who will afresh believe in things we thought we'd dismissed, spiritualism, uh, table wrapping, table turning, uh, conjury, levitation, all this nonsense has to be refuted in every generation. We don't evolve out of this. It's, a, it's an argument we have to have anew every time, as we do the argument about whether or not there is a supernatural dimension instead of a philosophical one, and you now know which side of that I take. It, to everybody in line, we know you've given your questions a lot of thought. It takes real courage to get up there, but we're just flat out of time. I, oh, I no. apologize. Blame me, you but we wanted to give... Maybe take one more. Well, well, I was just give us a say, chance to wrap up. Well, I was just going to say, wanted to give you each a chance to wrap up. Uh, uh, I'd rather have a question. I really would. Because okay. we, we both, I think, would have to be acquitted... No, couldn't be acquitted of having given rather long right. answers. It, which is great. And, and gentlemen in the front, if you'd be <clears throat> kind enough, and we're grateful for it, to defer to student, appears to be an underclassman, I may be wrong, thank you for your indulgence on that. Sir, you'll be the last question. All right, I'm a student from CU. Um, my question is from Mr. Hitchens. If we use the scientific method to test the power of prayer and there was enough evidence for the scientific community to create a theory about it, would you consider the existence of God? Well, there are two answers to that question. One is that these this has actually been minutely studied, and you can read the findings, the, the, uh, the study of intercessory prayer, that's to say, prayer that is designed to affect an outcome, in other words, to make someone in hospital get better. And it's been found, I, I used to think that they would find there was no effect of it at all, um, which was what was found with one slight variable, that very often the person being prayed for the most did slightly worse. The reason being that they felt bad for all the people they knew were praying for them. And the fact they weren't getting any better. Well, I'm just now, saying if the scientific community had well, I'm just saying, I, you Well, you're, ask, you're asking me if my, aunt, if my aunt had bollocks, would she be my uncle? Yeah. <laughs> my answer to the question is, if she did grow testicles, I think she still wouldn't be my uncle. The British royal family, I was raised an Anglican, as you may possibly guess. The British royal family has prayers mandated for it to be said. Prayers every single day by every single Anglican in every single service. Prayers for that family, okay? Have you read about the doings of this family lately? <laughs> the most prayed for family in the world. I would take that as the control experiment if I was here. I'm so glad you asked. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that we've done it yet, but if... If Let me take did. a shot. If you're saying, what would it take to convince me? Okay, I, I, won't, well, be, I, I won't be frivolous. Here's, if I thought I saw a just miracle. Just using the scientific method. If I thought I saw a dead person walking, for example, I would be much more inclined to think that I was the victim of a hallucination than that I had seen the laws of nature suspended in my favor. That's just the way I am. I think David Hume was right. The laws of nature have just been suspended apparently in front of your very eyes, which nonetheless is likelier that they have been suspended, in your favor, almost always, by the way, uh, or that you are under a misapprehension. Always, to me, the first explanation would be the least uh, probable one. The likelihood that I was having a hallucination would have to occur to me. The problem. Because it wouldn't occur to me if I was undergoing a hallucination, but that's how these ideas get spread around. <laughs> the problem is that we don't have final knowledge on what the laws of nature are. If at the time of David Newton you had, and the type of David Hume, you had said to him, light is both a particle and a wave, he would say that that was contradictory. 
if you had described to him even the most elementary operations of computers or quantum mechanics, he would have dismissed them as ridiculous. That's not because these are contradictions of the laws of nature. They are, in fact, the laws of nature unknown to David Hume. The question that you asked, I think, is very powerful because you didn't say it. You weren't claiming an empirical proposition. You were really asking Kitchens a different question. Is your mind open to being changed? If evidence shows one thing, are you willing to change your mind? To no, which no, his answer was a resounding no. No, 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 no. He started, the other, he started at the other end. He said, suppose the scientific proof occurs. And I had to say what I thought the probabilities of that were. And I well, hope with sufficient... How many tests have there been done? Now, so wait a minute. You've got, you've got one more chance to put those paws together. <laughs> Are you going to take it or not? The hardcore. No, even the... No, I didn't say Let's anything. Let's take a final question if I we did can. say how my mind works, not how it would be changed. I would still say, faced with a supposed miracle, it's much more likely that I'm under a misapprehension. Now, that is, it is an absolute slander, to say, of David Hume, that confronted with... Uh, evolution of scientific method based on what little he had known of it, projecting it exponentially or in any other way, that he would have said, no, that can't be right because I don't know about it. That is totally to misunderstand the way that Hume thought and wrote, utterly to, to misunderstand the whole proposition of skepticism. The gentleman have asked to finish with the question. Sir, would you be willing to defer to the student behind you? Sure. Thank no, you very much. Really appreciate it. I know you've waited a long time. I am a student. Pardon me? I am a student. Let her rip. <laughs> so are we all. So are we all. Yes, thank you. Uh, there has been a lot of talk and question tonight about morality and justice. While I am a student, my work mostly is in Los Angeles in the criminal justice system, where I am a forensic specialist and an investigator. When I go to work, I put my hand on the Bible, and the questions are asked, you know, will you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? To which I uncomfortably have to say I do. Um, in those trials, most of which are murder trials and capital Sir, trials. I, I do apologize, but I'll they're going to turn the lights out on us. Quickly. Is there a question? Give me very quickly. Great. Fast forward or backwards to a class here where I have a theology teacher saying to me that I cannot There's always one. Boy, sir, I, I, I do apologize, okay. but ask no, that, that's what happened to the don't tase me bro guy. It, it, no, I, no I, I, I'm sorry, sir. I've, that's There's what they one. pay me for. Sorry, we've got to. Uh, Ma'am, do you want to ask the last question? And, and sir, respect your passion, but we've got to get a question going here. Ma'am, go right ahead. Don't boo her, hey, you, you, just give her a chance. Go ahead, please. Mr. Hitchens, you have said that you think current science on embryology makes clear that pre-born humans are children deserving of some protection, correct? My question is for you, as an atheist, are as follows. First, what exactly do you think the nature of pre-born humans is? And second, how do you, on what grounds do you argue with your materialist friends who disagree with you that they are deserving of some protection and that they have value? Right. Well, it's, it's a materialist question to begin with. I mean, embryology is a materialist science, and the, even if you didn't think that before the recent discoveries about, say, the early viability of a, an unborn child or fetus, embryo, whatever you wish to call it, um, made, there was no question that it was alive. It wasn't just a, a jungle of cells or a tumor or an appendix, as some feminists used to refer to the unborn. In my, my memory, Said it, was, it was simply a growth on and of the woman's body, not a, a separate thing, not a living thing. Not the early feminists. The, the, the question, the question b would resolves itself to me like this. It's obviously alive. There's an element of casuistry in asking, well, what kind of alive is it? I mean, if it's, if it's a life, it must be a human one. It can't be a non-human or inhuman one. So all these questions are decided um, that way. I'm not a pacifist. I don't think that there are no circumstances in which a, a human life can be taken or the balance of one life doesn't have to be measured by all kinds of uh, means against another, but I, I think that it's uh, e extraordinarily objectionable uh, to exclude the occupant of the womb from this as if 
they, they weren't uh, candidate members of the human race. <coughs> Christopher, I want to say um, I was tempted to glib glibly congratulate you for finally getting something right, but I actually want to go much further. And um, that's how we met. I want to commend you for for really a courageous statement at in this setting. Um, I do want to offer a thought, though. A few times in this debate, you've used the phrase "celestial dictatorship," and I think it's a telling phrase because it gets a little bit, I think, to what's going on here. In thinking about this issue of God, we have to ask, what is the reason for our resistance to God? And then what are the reasons we give in public? The reasons we give in public have to do with things like science and the absence of evidence it implies the evidence of absence and this sort of thing. But in reality, that may not be the real source of our opposition. In fact, I don't think it is. I think ultimately it's not that you don't believe in God. And it's not even that you don't believe in the resurrection. I don't even think you care one way or the other. It seems to me that what you really worry about are the strictures of Christian morality. And ultimately, that's probably what a lot of us in the audience also worry about. If Christianity is true, gee, then morality isn't just something I make up as I go along. There really are some commandments I need to follow, and there are certain ways in which I may have to constrict my lifestyle. In other words, I can't live exactly the way I want. The freedom I enjoy in college doesn't necessarily entail complete moral freedom. So Christianity in this sense is viewed not as untrue but as oppressive, as in a sense being an inconvenience to your life as the way you want to live it. And so you resist it. But now that you resist it, you can't say that you actually don't want to live by a moral code or by an external or a traditional moral code. And so you've got to convince yourself that it's really brilliance that's bringing you to this position and not a resistance to Christian morality. And so you begin to spout off a bunch of physics you don't know and a bunch of history that you don't know and a bunch of theology that you don't understand. And it's all aimed at affirming that there is no God, so I don't really have to follow his rules. In a sense, you get rid of the idea of moral judgment by abolishing the judge. So in some senses, I think these debates are not just about winning arguments, they're also about a certain kind of psychological introspection in which we ask what are not, we know the motives for belief, right, wishful thinking. What are the motives for unbelief? What payoff does that give you? Why do you feel better by not believing? I think when we examine these things, we, we complete the circle that I think this debate began, namely the idea of applying skepticism and criticism in the best way that a university can, which is to say, to make it self-criticism. Thank you. Mm. Sir? Well, it seems as if all our Dinesh's and my self-denying attempts to spare you our closing perorations have been negated somehow. You're gonna get them whether you want them or not. Um, Again, Dinesh is so nearly right, and uh, I'm reminded by the last questioner that we actually first met because when he was working for President Reagan and I was writing for The Nation magazine, I wrote a piece about abortion that called itself to his attention, and he invited me to lunch. It seems like a long time ago now, but uh, it was a nice uh, meeting of minds at that time. Um, and there's no reason why this one shouldn't be the same, but I don't think I spoke in such a way tonight or, at, or on any other occasion or have written in such a way as to lay myself open to the, that last piece of misrepresentation. It is certainly true that I consider that the question of liberty of the mind is involved in the repudiation of theism, yes. I think that we would be living in a celestial dictatorship if we accepted the authority scripturally revealed of a divine will. And, and I think this not because under the inconvenient scrutiny of this I, I'm not free to rape and pillage and lie as I might wish, because there are other things, I assure you, as I'm sure you will say for yourselves, those of you with any self-respect, that stop me from doing that. But because, and I don't mind admitting this is true, once you grant that there's been a revelation of God to some humans, sometimes, in some places, to be interpreted by a priesthood, then the next thing you will find is that you are being told what to do, what to eat, what you can read, 
uh, who you can go to bed with, by someone who is no better a mammal or primate than yourself, but who claims to be doing this. <laughs> who claims the right to run your life and your sex life and your mind and your reading matter in the name of God. And I won't have it, okay? And the next thing they'll tell you, the next thing they'll ask you for, the next thing, just be a little thing is, well, go and live on this piece of someone else's territory. God wants you to settle it. The next thing will be, ah, you're called to holy war now because we can't coexist with the infidel. The next thing will be that. Let it in once, and you let it in all of it. Of all the questions of mine that Dinesh didn't even attempt to answer this evening, because we were talking not about Christianity, but about religion, was, is this only true for one sect, or is it true for all of them? If it's only true for one, on what grounds is that the case? If it's true for all of them, where would that leave us as a species? Think on these things, ladies and gentlemen. Think on these things as you go home. Thank you. Thanks. As the opening speaker, I get the chance to very briefly close. And you do? <laughs> these are some very yeah, right old there. rules. <laughs> uh, they might be Christian rules, but they also have been embedded Great. in Western civilization for a long Calling time. Calling a lot on my Christian forbearance. Uh, besides, they're on our program. <laughs> uh, I'll be very brief. Um, first of all, I do yeah, want to yeah. say that that statement I made a moment ago was not, uh, ex was not directed at you. I was actually doing something that um, it's traditionally done in debate. I was actually turning the camera to the audience and I was actually asking particularly young people um, that we know that, that college is the time when many people who are raised with religious beliefs relinquish them. And one possible explanation is that young people go to science classes and just get a heck of a lot smarter. But there is a second explanation. Uh, and that is that you are living in a condition where morality becomes an encumbrance and religion becomes inconvenient and begins to say things that you would rather not believe and prescribes ways of living that you'd rather not live. Now, Christopher Hitchens implies that this is done by force. I think you know from your own life it is not. It is not. The reason, the reason that you want to shake off religion is because it is not done by force. It is only done by your own consent. So in other words, in some senses, these are, this is the Christian way. Are you made to follow it? No. You have every freedom to do it. Even in Islam, by the way. Islam is easily maligned, I know. But even in Islam, as someone who grew up in a world that's large, largely Hindu and Muslim, um, the, uh, Islam has all kinds of sanctions, uh, licenses for conquest. But what it does not give license for is forcible conversion to Islam. That is specifically forbidden. Now. The point I'm trying to get at here is we may or may not, in both cases, we are asked to make a voluntary choice. And I think in making this choice, there have to be consequences. All we're saying is there are good reasons to be a believer. It's not obvious what comes after death. Ultimately, you have to look at the world and your place in it and make your decision. But just remember, ultimately, that it is your own happiness that is at issue. And it's the claim of religious believers, not that you are forced into it, but that if you accept it, ultimately you live a com more complete, a more balanced, a more decent, a more just, and yes, a more happy life. Thank you very much. Sure. Gentlemen, I think I speak for everyone here by saying it's been a real privilege to have you with us tonight. I don't think anybody here will forget this night for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.